the Capital Investment Committee for March for April 8th is called to order. This remote hearing is taking place in accordance to House Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by the House Public Information Office. Mr. Lancheski, please take the roll. Murphy present. Ms. Nash, is Mr. Lancheski on? He is not. I can do the roll though. Okay. Um, Chair Lee? Lee present. Vice Chair Murphy? Murphy present. Lee Erdo? Rep Abaje? Present. Rep Berg? Present. Rep Davids? Davids present. Rep Frankie? Present. Rep Freiburg? Present. Rep Hansen? Present. Rep Hewitt? Present. Rep Lilly? Present. Rep Lucero? Good morning. Good morning. Rep Moran? Present. Rep Pearson? Pearson present. Rep Raleigh? Raleigh present. Rep Rasmussen? Rasmussen present. Rep Ryer? Present. Rep West. Present. Rep Zhang Jay. Present. Uh, quorum is present. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nash. A quorum is present. Uh, Representative Murphy, can I have a motion Ms. to approve the minutes for April 6? I move approval of the minutes for April 6 as printed. Uh, Representative Murphy, move approval of the minutes for April 6. Any discussions? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes for April 6 is approved. Uh, members, we will have a number of equity bill hearings today on an informational basis only. Uh, each presentation is a lot of five minutes or even less will be better uh, with one testifier. I will strictly enforce the uh, time limit so that we can get all the bills in. The first bill is Representative Hassan, House File 1871. Please proceed, Representative Hassan. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I have internet issues, so I, you won't see me on camera today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present House File 1871, an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for improvement uh, to the Native American Community Clinic in the city of Minneapolis. The Native American Community Clinic is a nationally recognized community health clinic and federally qualified health center in South Minneapolis that provides comprehensive behavior health dental and primary care services to the Twin Cities Native American community. NAC serves over 5,000 patients annually, 94% of whom live below the 200% poverty guidelines and over 80% of who are from the Native American community. NAC has been the center of so many uh, talents in the recent years. They serve many people experiencing homelessness. They have been leaders in finding novel ways to address the opioid epidemic. They are located two miles uh, away from where George Floyd was murdered and they have been leaders in COVID testing and vaccinations for underserved communities over the past year. As we all know, Native American patients have far worse health outcomes than their white counterparts. For six of the seven Minnesota community measurements, MNCM and substance abuse and mental health issues are significantly and disproportionately affect the Native community. While incidence rates for disease are higher and the need for primary care services are greater, trauma-informed uh, treatment options that address the need for this population are in drastically short supply. It's widely acknowledged that culturally specific approaches rooted in traditional forms of healing and medicine significantly improve the outcome for Native American community in the healthcare system. Um, the Native American Community Clinic is located in the American Indian cultural corridor in my district in South Minneapolis, the largest concentration of Native Americans in Minnesota are urban dwellers who reside in South Minneapolis within one to three mile radius around the NAX location. <clears throat> they reside in South Minneapolis. Um, the majority of these residents report challenge in accessing quality healthcare services. Uh, last session, NAC requested six million, but in the end received 3.8 million for phase one to purchase the building where they are located. That phase one funding grant last year was absolutely critical to their mission. 
that funding allowed NAC to purchase the building that they have occupied for nearly two years, uh, two decades in the American American Indian Cultural Corridor at Franklin Avenue, South Minneapolis. The 2.2 million for phase two we're requesting this session includes um, improvement and modernization of the current footprint as well as the build out of the newly equipped clinic footprint. When finished, the project would create additional 10 medical rooms, five uh, dental exam rooms, expanded laboratory and diagnostic services, and in-clinic pharmacy. The expansion will allow NAC to serve additional 2,000 new patients and combine 5,000 additional visits annually. With that, Mr. Chair, I have um, a testifier with me who would further explain the need for this project and will stand for questions. Thank you. Dr. Staley, uh, you have one minute. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, um, representatives. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Dr. Anthony Staley. I'm the CEO of the Native American Community Clinic in South Minneapolis. Thank you, Representative Hassan, for the introduction and a wonderful overview of the work we're doing. I appreciate it very much. Native American Community Clinic has been very successful over the last four years under my leadership and um, successfully um, competing for and acquiring and obtaining um, large um, federal investments in helping us to expand our behavioral health footprint, which is probably one of the biggest um, critical needs that we have in our community. Under that strategy, we have been able to significantly expand our capacity to deliver mental health services, suboxone services to people struggling with opiate use disorder, and to um, serve more of our, um, and to expand our outreach uh, program, which helps us to um, serve more of our homeless po population in South Minneapolis, which if you watch the news, you know that we're um, significantly overrepresented in that population um, in the urban core in, of both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, the challenge with that is, is that we have, as we have been able to get those um, grants and expand and deliver on our care model, our integrated care model, um, which includes culturally centered care, we have elders and residents that provide cultural and traditional healing services to our community. We have um, had to um, put our programs in um, spaces outside of our clinic which has been significantly challenging to um, operating an integrated um, model that we have had for several years now. Dr. Staley, can I have you wrap up, please? Sure. Um, this opportunity will help us to be able to um, modernize our clinic, which is um, needs need significant um, uh, renovation, and will also allow us to bring everybody back underneath one, um, one roof and be able to deliver better on our, our model. Thank you, Dr. Staley. Next up, we have uh, Representative Hansen's draft language code is CG 105. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, this is a provision for the remaining slaughterhouses in South St. Paul. Uh, South St. Paul is still designated as a redevelopment area by the federal government uh, from the loss of the slaughterhouses and packing plants uh, uh, over a generation ago. Uh, these slaughterhouses in South St. Paul draw a very diverse community from around the whole metro area and even into Wisconsin. I believe even the chair has slaughtered uh, some cows at the uh, facility. Uh, however, uh, it is an old facility and there is an uh, opportunity for redevelopment and building a new facility here that could really be uh, a star for the whole metropolitan area. Uh, uh, if you visit uh, the slaughterhouse, you will see uh, older Hmong women uh, slaughtering chickens. Uh, there are goats and sheep and cattle and pigs, uh, and uh, it's right close by if anybody wants to have a tour. So I have with me today Ryan Garcia uh, supporting uh, Bill 21-03983 uh, to provide for redevelopment and uh, for these businesses for equity. Uh, it is one of the most substantial things we could do uh, to provide for food uh, in the metropolitan area. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, good morning. Uh, Chair Lee, thank you. Representative Hansen, uh, committee members, my name is Ryan Garcia. I'm the uh, Director of Economic and Community Development for the City of South St. Paul. Uh, I think uh, Representative Hansen provided a, a really good summary. Um, 
the facilities. So, you know, South St. Paul's legacy as a major uh, manufacturer of food products, uh, not only for our metro area, but really for uh, the entire world uh, is, is longstanding. And while we have diversified and um, evolved with the loss of the major uh, food manufacturers that existed here uh, over a generation ago, we still do hold strong to that legacy. Obviously our high school is the Packers, um, once a Packer, always a Packer. Uh, and, and we do value uh, uh, the continued operation of, of these uh, vital and, and uh, essential uh, services and businesses in our community. We understand that they represent um, uh, a, a really good embodiment, frankly, of the American dream uh, with uh, uh, immigrant uh, owners uh, that are looking to grow their facilities, looking to grow their businesses, uh, unfortunately, in facilities that are now over 75 years old are prohibitively uh, expensive to upgrade and repair and have significant deficiencies uh, with respect to uh, the ability to expand within uh, those facilities and on those sites. Uh, so the city is, is, has been working uh, with our, uh, our, our continued operators uh, to identify locations uh, in South St. Paul and to vet those locations. We feel like we have uh, solutions to help them. Uh, uh, with their real estate needs and certainly uh, would uh, embrace the opportunity to be their partner in uh, facilitating a generation of, of uh, sustainable growth for their businesses and in upgraded uh, new facilities. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, help answer any questions or uh, we'll yield to the chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Garcia. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to speak positively of this project and thank representative hansen for bringing this bill forward these businesses are in a city which i share with representative hansen in representation and um they are there's definitely a cultural need for these businesses and they bring commerce to our area from all over the twin cities and beyond so once again thank you representative hansen for bringing this forward uh thank you representative frankie for your work too with representative hansen on this representative Zhang, quick comment Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that this is more than just a slaughterhouse. It's a cultural hub for many of our re refugee immigrant families. So I hope that we can consider this uh, legislation uh, as we talk about equity. Uh, thank you, Representative Zhang. So next on the agenda is two bills for Representative Zhang. The first one is House File 1554. Please proceed, Representative Zhang. Can you remind me which one is 1554? 30,000 feet. All right, 30,000 <laughs> feet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 30,000 feet is an institution uh, right here on the east side of St. Paul. Its mission is to advance the academic success of African-American youth and families through culturally responsive arts and tech education, social emotional learning, and African-American history and culture. Since its founding in 2013, they have served over 2,500 students in St. Paul, and they do it through their core programs, which uh, one of them is after school programming, uh, a black tech geeks program, and an artist residency, residency program. Um, and so I, uh, without further ado, I'll just leave it here and let uh, my testifier, uh, Miss Vanessa Young, speak more to the great work that they're doing. Miss Young, uh, you. please identify, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Absolutely. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Young. I'm the program director, <clears throat> excuse me, at 30,000 feet. Um, thank you, Chair Lee, for giving me time to speak and Representative Zhang for authoring the bill and Rep Erdahl and Thompson for meeting with us. And thank you, Rena, for continuing to support our work. Um, so since our existence, we've been um, helping students enter into the tech field with there's there's about 9,000 job openings in Minnesota in the tech field that um, students of color um, have not traditionally gone into. We want to help um, stop that from happening and, and help them to get into the field. We're also helping students combat summer learning loss where students lose on average 36% of their school year gains and a whopping 50% of the school year gains of, um, in math. And that keeps growing as they get older. Um, in addition to combating summer learning loss, we help youth um, with arts learning, which encourages fine motor skills, neural development, problem solving abilities, um, and 
competencies that allow for greater success in a more traditional subjects like reading, writing, and science and math. And so as we imagine as we reimagine the rest of 2021 together, we will be on the ground working to create the first space where black youth in St. Paul can be their authentic selves to help us make a better Minnesota by proactively investing in their collective success. Uh, the Black Arts Center will provide a space for both creative learning experience and overcoming barriers to employment through paid art and tech apprenticeships. Each apprenticeship completion will be for a minimum of six months where youth can help bring additional income to their homes. Um, and they'll be making about $15 an hour, working 15 to 20 hours a week <clears throat> to enter into the tech field. The center will provide a safe space for daytime academic support for youth who are continuously suspended from school, increase the number of Black youth who gain meaningful employment through apprenticeships, and decrease teen violence and recidivism on the east side by providing a space for restorative justice in year-round apprenticeships. Um, our program has operated in communities, schools, libraries, rec centers, churches, and our program has outgrown many of these spaces, so we're asking that House file um, 1554 um, allocates 1.5 million in, in the capital investment to go towards purchasing a dedicated space. The 4,000 square foot center will be located on the east side of St. Paul as Representative Zhang mentioned. It will include a space for multiple multidisciplinary art, a computer science lab, a maker space, library slash bookstore, um, and a common area, an art gallery, and two small offices. Uh, we plan to double our impact by continuing our strength I mean, excuse me, by continuing to strengthen our programs and simply doubling the number of students that we serve. To carry the burden of cost, to help us carry the burden of cost, thus far, we have secured over $200,000 in support for this project from crowdfunding, private foundations like HB Fuller, Best Buy, um, Ramsey County, and USA Today. And we look forward to building a better future together. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Young. Chair Moran? Uh, good morning, um, everyone, and, and Chair Lee, thank you for bringing this bill forward, and J, uh, Representative Yang, uh, Zong for bringing this bill forward. Real quick, I just want to speak in support of the bill. Um, 30,000 feet, who has been around for over eight years, uh, formerly known as New Abam, has been really a foundation on the east side of St. Paul, working with youth year-round, just strengthening their skills, their knowledge base, the relationships and the connections is what we need to make sure that our youth is um, striving to be the best that they can be. Uh, um, I just want to just lift up the work that they have, have done and continue to do around the youth apprenticeship pieces. Uh, they have been in places, as we heard from Ms. Young, from communities, from schools, from library, just to make the work that they do um, uh, impactful. So uh, again, I just wanna speak in support of uh, 30,000 feet and um, just introduce to this legislative body the great work that they have been doing and would like to continue to do through an expanded space. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moran. Next on the agenda is Representative Zhang's bill, House File 2382, Representative Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is another great institution uh, right here in St. Paul. Uh, the Funny Asian Woman Collective was founded in 2013. Um, you do a lot of great programming. I remember hearing about this group uh, several years ago after graduating from college and hearing from many of my friends about uh, the great work that they were doing to um, uh, combat and tackle many of the uh, systemic problems in, the com in our community. And so without further ado, uh, today I have Ms. Maylee Yang uh, here to testify to share more about the institution and what this legislation uh, will do for our community here in Minnesota. Uh, Ms. Lee Yang, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, everybody. My name is Mei Li Yang, and I'm one of the co-founders of Funny Asian Women Collective, also known as FOC. Um, I am a Eastside resident and homeowner. And first of all, I'd like to thank Representative Shang for championing this bill and Chair Lee for giving us the space to, to hear our story. So first of all, I am a Hmong American artist. And when I was growing up, theater did not exist in the Hmong community. In fact, the first Hmong theater company internationally was birthed right here in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1994. 27 years later, there is still no physical space to host Hmong stories, and there is no Pan-Asian American Arts Center. 
to be sure, there are many uh, Asian American arts organizations in existence in Minnesota, but we are constantly guests in someone else's house. Fox centers our work around Asian Pacific Islander Desi American stories because Apetus are the country's fastest growing racial group. Yet Apetus are one of the most underrepresented groups in TV, film, and entertainment. Between 2007 and 2017, we only made up 3.2% of all folks in the film sector. Uh, the Twin Cities is home to the most diverse, uh, one of the most diverse Apita populations, and we have the largest concentration of Hmong in the United States. Fresno, California can fight me on this if they'd like. Uh, we also comprise 32% of the East Side, and yet less than 2% of East Siders report working in the arts, entertainment, and recreation industry. So this is Fox Story. We were founded in 2014 to combat the invisibility and dehumanization of Asian Pacific Islander Desi American women using comedy and humor. Uh, I'd like to just show a quick, show a couple photos to give you an idea of what we do. Okay. So uh, we use comedy, performance, art, and storytelling to navigate controversial issues such as race, gender, patriarchy. Our program includes uh, curating live performances, workshops, and trainings. These are photos from a show we did at the Orderway Center for Performing Arts in 2019. Um, and I just wanna note that the recent shootings in Atlanta and the rise of xenophobia, particularly assaults against Asian women in this country, is a clear demonstration that there is an increased need to see more Asian American stories, to see more of our humanity. Our vision with this bonding bill is to create the first pan-Asian American women-led state-of-the-art multimedia and performing arts center open to all. This will be the first center of its kind. This is kind of crazy, right? First of its kind, not just in St. Paul, not just in Minnesota, but in the nation, not even California in New York who think they're pretty artsy and diverse and cool has such a space. The Asian American Center for Media Arts will have a large soundstage, recording studios, a 300 seat theater. Um, in this photo, there's, there's actually, I think, 900 seats. So uh, community rooms and a gallery for visual art. We know that there is a need for more art centers in St. Paul and particularly the East Side, spaces that hold collaborations, performances, creative and economic incubations, mentorships, and more. We're asking for funds to support the acquisition of property, pre-design, design, site preparation and pre-construction and uh, renovation. So we feel strongly that the existence of an Asian American media and performing arts center can not only become a home for new stories, but it can be a space to build community across culture and also build wealth for our city. The first time I saw a, a, a play that centered around a Hmong story, it was powerful to see my experiences reflected on the stage the problem with live performances is that it is fleeting. This art center, which will not only hold live performances, but also create video work is important, not just for FOC. It is an institution that can hold stories for generations long after we have retired. It is a legacy that we can leave behind, again, not just for St. Paul, not just for Minnesota, but for the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lee Ying for being on time. Next up we have Representative Thompson, House File 2400. Representative Thompson, you're on mute right now. I was so excited you called my name. But listen, Chair, I'm excited to, to present to you uh, my bill, which is House File 2400, uh, that will bring investments to shovel, you know, to shovel ready projects, to shovel ready project for the east side of St. Paul. I feel like I heard that like 20 times already. <laughs> but uh, owned and led by the Latino, Economic Development Center, what was LEDC, and this type of community development project that, that I'm interested in. Like the East Side needs investments from our state, and this is the first project that I bring forth to this committee. <clears throat> La Plaza de Sol, located at 900 Payne Avenue in St. Paul, recently has been acquired by LEDC with the intention to support the diverse small businesses in our district and in my neighborhood. However, the building is in need of some capital improvements and the recent acquisition of uh, Plaza de Sol by LADC has helped businesses that would have been displaced. Uh, and because of uh, uh, the LADC, these businesses will continue to serve our community by providing uh, culturally uh, and logistically the appropriate services and goods. Uh, because of what LADC does and is intended to do with this building is what they do best. This is what they do best, and that is, uh, continue to serve small businesses, 
as an as a small business incubator, housing several small businesses at any given time. It would also include a commercial kitchen inside of this building, which can be utilized by 20 plus food vendors for food catering services for individual uh, individuals starting their own business. You know, this would include uh, a second floor with office space, uh, and, and this space could be utilized by small businesses and nonprofits, along with classroom space, which will continue to serve as a, a hub for GED training and other training, English entrepreneurships and classes to the east side, which our kids definitely need. Um, it will also include space that will be accessed by small business, nonprofits, and families for their professional or cultural functions. My community is much in much need of this space and this investment from you guys here, I mean, Chair, in this body. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I urge you to support this project on St. Paul. And I would like to uh, yield uh, for any questions, if you have any, but I would like to give Henry Jimenez uh, just a few minutes, if you will, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, you have less than two minutes. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Again, my name is Henry Jimenez, Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center. Um, I did have a little bit more than two minutes, but I, I'm gonna say that Representative Thompson did a great job telling you about uh, the project. I'm excited about what, what we can do in, in, in St. Paul. Uh, what I wanna make sure I, I say to this committee right now is I'm actually somewhat emotional to see all these projects and we, we're not even halfway there. This is the type of projects that uh, the future of Minnesota really needs. Um, th these are communities that uh, uh, definitely all deserve these type of projects. And so uh, Representative Lee, uh, members of the committee, I actually think you're, you're doing history today to be able to hear these type of projects. And so I, I thank you for that. Going back to our uh, LEDC project in the east side of St. Paul, I, I just want you to know, this is a, a, a building that LEDC has recently acquired. Every, every narrative, every rhetoric I hear from legislators, from, from the governor to legislators to congressional members, it's exactly what we're doing here today, not just LEDC, but everybody that's mentioning it. Everybody's talking about BIPOC ownership and property. Well, here, here we are. Here's a project that LEDC has that we have purchased and we have put all of our financial efforts in. We have a plan of what other resources are gonna be coming for this project. We're just asking the state to do its part in helping us get to the finish line, just like many of these other projects. Uh, some of your attachments to this, pro uh, uh, to this bill, 2400, you'll see our breakdown. I mean, you'll see our investment from LEDC. You'll see the pre-development grant money. You'll see the type of neighborhood star money at the municipal level, uh, our capital campaign the state funds. I mean, we even we even got a lobbyist for this, folks. I'm telling you, every every checkbox you have ever asked of LEDC or any of our organizations to do, we have done. I am uh, ready for questions, but what I could tell you is that the east side of St. Paul uh, definitely needs to be invested in, and this is uh, a perfect uh, building to invest in. I look forward to Representative Thompson continuing to bring uh, his family to the building. I, I know he visits it all the time. He walks by it every day. I look forward to being able to show you what we're actually capable of doing. This is not a theory, folks. This is a reality. This will happen. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. So we Next up, we have uh, Chair Noor, House File 2398. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Lee and members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this bill, 2398. Uh, it is uh, for uh, healthcare workforce development. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to recognize this week as uh, the National uh, Public Health uh, Week and for their contribution, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. A strong public uh, health uh, worker is vital to protecting all individuals, whether we are in Minnesota or anywhere in the world. Uh, so this bill, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, is to purchase the building, which is a few blocks away from my building, which used to be my clinic, uh, the Health Partners Clinic, and convert it to becoming a center for new Americans and also be able to provide the, the workforce development for public health. Uh, members, as you're aware of, the American Rescue Plan provided various funding. One of the funding is to help establish 
expand uh, public health workers, and it's an opportunity for us to really invest in a workforce development that will be training public health workers and getting the resources from the federal government. This is an opportunity for us to work with the University of Minnesota, with employers, with other agencies to really develop a robust system that provides a family sustaining wage for individuals who are looking for an opportunity to be in the healthcare workforce development. We cannot miss this opportunity by not investing in a site that is already ready. Uh, it's, it was built in 1991. It's no longer being used as a, a clinic. It's ready to serve in terms of that training purpose. It's connected to the M Health. It's right next to the University of Minnesota. It's an ideal site for us to invest in and also to be able as the chair for the workforce uh, development to go for that resources that is already at the table to allow us to develop uh, uh, the next generation, the future in public health work. So I'll ask for your support. It's about uh, less than $10 million. I'm hoping that we can do it. And I'm asking for your support. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I'm ready to answer any question that you may have. Chair Noor, I understand that your testifier had uh, some technical issue. Is your testifier on? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with uh, so many internet connection uh, issues, uh, I don't see my testifier online. Okay. Well, uh, we don't see any questions, so thank you, Chair Noor. Next up is Chair Mariani, uh, House File 2466. Uh, Chair Mariani, uh, you have three minutes for this presentation. Super. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill makes technical changes to a bond allocation that was made in 2018 and support workforce training provided by the HAP. By HAP, uh, the Hmong American Partnership, uh, their uh, facilities are located in my district. Uh, their bricks and mortar challenges were pretty severe. They were very incredibly limited uh, to provide important services uh, that they do uh, to our county. Um, and nonetheless, uh, HAP has done just uh, stellar, amazing work um, partnering with Ramsey County, providing uh, uh, training and job placement for MINFIP uh, participants. Uh, working uh, with young people to connect them to customized uh, job training programs, uh, et, et cetera. This bill makes several technical changes. It replaces the city of St. Paul with Ramsey County. It deletes unnecessary language to pre-design and design. It just keeps uh, focus on the acquisition uh, proposal. Uh, it also allows um, a child care facility uh, to be recognized within uh, the project uh, because there's a strong synergy between uh, providing benefits uh, to training uh, participants uh, with those kind of services. Um, and finally, uh, if this committee has the ability, uh, converting this project to a cash investment provides us a much simpler path uh, to finishing. I'm happy to be joined by uh, Bao Bang from the Hmong American Partnership and she can provide very brief uh, words for the committee as well. Ms. Vane, you have less than a minute. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Lee and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. My name is Bao Vang, and I served as the president and CEO of the Hmong American Partnership for nearly 14 years until I retire in this past January. I'm currently an advisor to HAP's board of director and its interim executive director. First of all, I just want to reiterate our sincere appreciation and thank you to Representative Mariani and the many legislators and local officials who supported passing the bond allocation to HAP in 2018. The support of the state in 2018 jumpstart HAP's capital campaign process. And I'm here today to seek your support of making these technical changes so the bond allocation that was approved to HAP in 2018 can be realized. Again, I thank you so much for this opportunity and for your support, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Vang, and thank you, Chair Mariani, for that presentation. Next up, we have Chair Becker Fenn, a language code of CG102-1. Please proceed. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so earlier this year, my cousin Michael died at the age of 36 from COVID. Uh, like me, he grew up in Cass Lake on the Leech Lake Reservation, and there are not a lot of large gathering places in my home community, but our Veterans Memorial Building is one of them. Uh, Michael served 12 years in the Air Force, so it was a given that we would hold his funeral there. 
Uh, the Leech Lake Vet Center is one of those buildings used so often by people in the community for funerals, graduation parties, community meals, meetings, programming, powwows that, uh, like many of us, I had become accustomed to its perpetual state of disrepair as it was built in 1980. Um, but in February, as I was helping to set up chairs for the funeral, it hit me how sad it is. Uh, that this building where we celebrate our community's accomplishments and send off our warriors is, is falling apart in multiple, multiple ways. Uh, so I started to make some phone calls and I am incredibly proud to bring this bill before you today. Uh, rebuilding the, what the folks in the community call the Vet Center has been on Leech Lake's list of buildings in need of repair, but with 11 tribal communities within the large reservation and uncertain times, the funds are very much needed so that we can build something that properly shows the respect we have for those who have served and continue to function as a gathering place for everyone in the community. Uh, also, a modern building could be made more accessible for our veterans and elders who have disabilities. Um, I do want to emphasize that many people in the community would benefit from this space, not just veterans. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the Leech Lake Reservation is several hours north of St. Paul, we, with the largest near, near city, nearby city being Bemidji. Uh, over 10,000 people call the Leech Lake area home, which includes tribal members, but also many non-tribal members as well. Uh, the Vet Center is also located within just feet of the bleachers at our powwow grounds, and the facilities in the building are used by the public during the three large powwows held there each year. Uh, visiting dancers uh, and other visitors travel to the area from all over the country as well as Canada, so there's an important economic piece involved for the larger community as well. Uh, Chi miigwech to Chair Lee for hearing this important bill, even though the impetus to move it forward came a bit later in the game. Uh, the Leech Lake community was hit hard over the last year and now would be an incredibly meaningful time to move forward with this project. Uh, the bill is in the hopper, so it will have a number uh, by tomorrow. Uh, again, uh, miigwech for your time and attention. Uh, when it's safe to do so, I would love to host any of you to see the building and uh, attend a powwow. And if, if you do make the drive up, I would even uh, likely buy you a piece of fry bread. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will turn it over to my testifier, uh, Clinton Fairbanks. Well, thank you, Chair Becker uh, Mr. Fairbanks, you have less than three minutes. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning. My name is Clinton Fairbanks. I am government relations. Uh, thank you to, for allowing me to testify today. Um, Chair Lee, members of the Capital Investment Committee, it is with deep respect that I am requesting funding to be approved for a placement building for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. The original building was designed roughly 3,000 square feet in 1980. There were additions added on in 1991, which added uh, approximately 1,000 extra square feet to bring the total to about 4,100 square feet. This building has served its purpose through its 40 years, holding hundreds if not thousands of funerals wakes for LLBO band members, specifically for our veterans, as well as non-band members and even non-native respected community members. Thousands of cultural native naming ceremonies, spiritual healing ceremonies, birthday parties, craft making sessions, native regalia making, beating, and other cultural gatherings. Community fundraiser, fundraisers. And uh, the facility is open to the public for showers, shelters, changing areas for powwows held annually. It is even used to be held at boxing events and boxing training. However, as you can see below this very old facility and the cost of the building's maintenance and heating are higher every year. It is serious in need of replacement in order to continue to serve our veterans and the greater LLBO community for generations to come. Additionally, this new building would be a critical upgrade to the whole Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Veterans Memorial Grounds. Most recently, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe received a grant from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and the Veterans Cemetery Grant Program 2019, and we have built the only tribal veteran cemetery in the state of Minnesota and have been recognized as a Blue Star Award winner of the Veterans Cemetery in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for considering and for your hard work on funding on many important priorities before the House Capital Investment Committee. We are looking forward to answering questions and providing additional information to the committee and we would welcome you to visit the Veterans Memorial Building site when it becomes possible. Miigwech. Thank you, Mr. Fairbanks, and thank you, Chair uh, becker Finn. Next up, we have Representative Agbaje, House File 2462. Please proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. 
Uh, this morning I'm presenting House File 2462. It is a project meant to support community members after the events of this past year. So from the effects of the pandemic and the killing of George Floyd, people, especially young people, are hurting. The organization 846seconds.org developed out of that need to help young people through this difficult time by providing mental health resources and a healing space to process. The funding we are requesting today would go towards the acquisition and construction of a building in South Minneapolis that would host a mental health facility, an artistic space, both for visual art and music, entrepreneurship training and tutoring for young people. This is anticipated to be a one-stop wellness shop for community members and 846seconds.org has already partnered with groups like Black Nurses Rock, Minnesota Black Nurses Association, and 612 MASH Clinic, among others, to provide such services to people within the community. The impact of such a location would be significant on a community of young people who have experienced so much in such a short period of time. To speak more on the impact that the center would have and the work that has already been done is my testifier, Isaac Dua. Uh Mr. Dua, please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, my name is Isak Dua. Uh, good morning, everyone. First off, I wanted to thank uh, you know uh, Chair Lee and the whole committee for this opportunity and Representative Baje uh, for championing this bill. Uh, like I said, my name is Isak Dua. I'm a sitting board member of A46S.org, which is a Black youth mental health focused nonprofit that me and my father established over the summer. And I'm also a Minneapolis-based uh, activist and community organizer. I'm 22 years old and I grew up in the Longfellow neighborhood, uh, four blocks away from the third precinct. And I graduated from South High School in 2016. Uh, when my neighborhood burned after the killing of George Floyd, I started distributing safety equipment and fire extinguishers during the day and volunteering as a security guard at George Floyd Square at 38th and Chicago at night. I experienced a lot of trauma that summer, as did most people in the South Side, especially young people. And on June 19th, I witnessed a murder and uh, my mother suggested that I go to therapy. So I eventually did, and after seeing the tangible difference in my ability to navigate my own emotions and take care of my own mental health, I wanted everyone uh, and all my peers to have access to that mental health uh, therapy. So over the summer of 2020, when I would take breaks from my community work and volunteering work to eat, I would park my car at empty lots all over the South Side, and uh, that's when I started to dream of this uh, Youth Mental Health Wellness Center. So I envisioned a, a building with lots of natural light and big windows in contrast to my experience at South High School, which for those of you who don't know, looks like a bunker and has very few windows. And in my winter months at South High School, I remember going to school early in the morning in the dark and leaving later in the day in the dark and not feeling the sunlight on my skin all day at school. Um, the vision that I have for this building is a place of healing a place ahead of its time, uh, built sustainably with a focus on green energy and net zero. Uh, I envisioned a one-stop shop for wellness where a mother could meet a mental health care professional in their satellite offices right in the community uh, while her children could get tutoring and homework assistance at the same time. Uh, this is in contrast to having to take three digit buses way out to the burbs or the suburbs uh, to see therapists. Uh, I envisioned a place where young people could get guidance and support on their startups and entrepreneurial endeavors. And I envisioned a community gathering and event space where youth could have uh, host events like art exhibits and launch parties and listen to guest speakers from all over the country and all over the world. I also envi envisioned a technology room where community members would have access to computers, IT training, tutoring, and homework assistance to helping youth acquire skills necessary for 21st century job opportunities. And finally, a youth run coffee shop where people can read study, relax, and imagine a better future. Uh, to wrap up my you know, little testimony, uh, I know that this community wellness center will be an amazing resource to my community. And I hope that I've enlightened you all a little bit more about the story behind this project and what kind of difference I know this proposal would make. Uh, thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Dua, and thank you, Representative Abadje, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, next up, we have Representative uh, Gomez, a uh, draft language coded CG103. Please proceed, Representative Gomez. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for hearing this bill. Um, this is to improve uh, Mercado Central, which is an important institution in South Minneapolis. It's cooperatively owned and led by Latino small business owners, and it's really, over its 20 years, become a true hub and anchor of the community of Bloomington and Lake Street in South Minneapolis. Um, you know, so many people in the community shop there, and it, they also have a you know, a meeting space. They host a lot of community events and 
really are um, a pillar. <clears throat> Last summer, many of the members of this body, I'm not sure if anybody on this call or not, um, but also the Senate, you know, the governor, congressional members visited Mercado Central because it was really in the epicenter of the, of the uprising um, and was impacted during that time. Um, so it, it is a cultural and economic hub that's created opportunity and fueled the kind of economic growth that as uh, Mr. Jimenez referenced in his earlier testimony that we all talk about wanting to support here at the, at the Capitol. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of amazing that they, you know, they've really been through a lot over the years and the fact the cooperative bought the building in the last few years is really an incredible um, achievement uh, for, this, for this group and you know, there have been some improvements to the exterior of the building, but but there are real uh, kind of capital investment needs. And, and so the Mercado has always been a part of the community, but the state really needs to step up to help the Mercado continue to stay a pillar of Lake of the Lake Street Business Corridor. Um, at this time, I just want to pass it over to um, Rosalba Herrera, and I want to thank her for her work. Um, she's the chair of the Mercado Central Board, and... Um, She's going to say a few words about the Mercado and its needs, and she'll do some Spanish and will provide some interpretation. Uh, thank you, Chair Gomez. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Herrera, uh, please identify yourself for the record. And for members, uh, Mr. Jimenez is here to interpret. Please proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Rosalba Herrera. I am the president of the board directors de la Cooperativa Mercado Central in Minneapolis. Quiero agradecer a cada uno de ustedes por la visita que nos hicieron el verano pasado después de los disturbios. Y aunque apreciamos sus visitas, la realidad es que necesitamos apoyo de ustedes. Establecida hace 21 años, la cooperativa Mercado Central es el hogar de 33 pequeños negocios propiedad de latinos. La idea del Mercado Central nació de la necesidad que tenía la comunidad latina en el sur de Minneapolis de tener un espacio para reconectarse con su cultura. Gracias a un grupo de microempresarios visionarios que se organizó para formar una cooperativa latina y ofrecer un lugar que sirviera como el centro de la comunidad, el comercio, la cultura, desde sus inicios. El mercado ha sido un centro económico para la comunidad. En los últimos 21 años hemos podido superar dos recesiones económicas y ahora una pandemia, pero nuestro mercado necesita inversión de capital para reemplazo de techo, cimientos, pisos y estacionamiento. Estos son proyectos urgentes para seguir cumpliendo con nuestro compromiso y objetivos. Los elevados costos de estos proyectos han complicado realizarlos Además, hemos sido afectados por la recesión económica causada por la pandemia de COVID-19. Por esta razón, solicitamos apoyo para realizar estos proyectos. Mercado Central es un emblema de la comunidad latina en el estado de Minnesota, especialmente en el sur de Minneapolis, y con su ayuda podremos mantener como tal. Gracias y siempre serán bienvenidos a Mercado Central. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair, for, for me to try to uh, translate all that, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult. So what we are going to do is provide uh, a, a translated statement in, in, in English uh, uh, shortly here. Um, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of points she, she made. Obviously, she wants to thank all of you. A, a significant number of you actually visit the Mercado Central last summer and, and actually has continued to do so. Uh, I think it's important to note that in 21 years, they have um, overcome, uh, you know, two recessions, the pandemic and, and, the, uh, and just the, the, the aftermath of last summer uh, in general. And, uh, you know, we've had uh, congressional members and, 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 and folks come, but nobody's really invested in, in Mercado Central. And it, I think it's time to, to think about that. If it's such an important stop in every tour from everyone to stop on Mercado Central, I think it's an important uh, project to invest in. And it's, uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't really received much investment from the state. Um, again, we'll provide more uh, testimony, but I wanted to say one, one last thing, and that's really to thank Rosalba Herrera uh, and the, Merc the, the Board of Mercado Central. Uh, it's really uh, entrepreneurs like herself who have uh, donated, volunteered her time to making uh, an economic hub like Mercado Central successful. It's really her leadership uh, and we have many more Ros Ros uh, uh, Rosalba Herreras in our community. And, and I'm just glad that 
she's she's having a a, a a minute here with you to to let you know about the great work she's done in Mercado. And thank you, Representative Gomez and uh, uh, Mr. I think with with that, I'll, I'll present a, a written English testimony for for the committee. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Uh, Representative Davids. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate that because I didn't understand the thing she said. So I don't know if this is a good project or a bad project or in between project because I didn't understand anything. So. I thank the gentleman for saying that he would get us the translation so we can uh, read it and study it and make our decision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Davids, for that. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jimenez. Please provide that written testimony to Ms. Nash. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Uh, next up, we have uh, Representative Zhang, House File 875. Well, Zhong, again, Mr. Chair, uh, this next bill is the African Economic Development Solution. And uh, it's for a bonding project for the Little Africa Plaza. Today, I have Mr. Jean Gilguru, who will be here to share more about this. Mr. Gilguru, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Lee and member of the committee. My name is Jean Gilguru, President and CEO at African Economic Development Solutions, AEDS and nonprofit organization that serve African immigrants in Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify for House File 875, the three million allocated to African Economic Development Solutions ADS for building rehab that is located at 678 Snelling Avenue, North St. Paul, Minnesota 55104. The building will activate a vacant and the condemned building in Hamlin Midway neighborhood in tax generating commercial asset. Located at 678 Avenue, the building was originally in 1920s era, a former Chevrolet dealership. After its rehabilitation, it will house immigrant-owned grocery store, cultural halls, the first African museum, cultural museum, and a day's office. We received $200,000 from federal and uh, hundred thousand dollar loan from the bank uh, to purchase the abandoned building. The project will help stabilize neighborhood commercial corridor, serve the cultural food need for African immigrant population, and provide a taste of African cuisine and uh, cultural uh, for larger community and uh, mitigate displacement issues that we uh, see. Entrepreneurship has been a route to prosperity and success for immigrants across the United States and in Minnesota. Today, small businesses continue to drive our economy and create two thirds of new jobs nationally. Their job creation role are particularly vital in immigrant communities where language and formal education bears lack many individuals out of wider job market. ADES has created a successful vehicle for harnessing African immigrant entrepreneurship spirit to create jobs and avenue out of poverty. ADES, a nonprofit organization that has established in 2008 to serve African immigrant in Minnesota. Our mission is world building within African immigrant community. We achieve this through our programs, business development training, cultural specific technical assistance, lending, financial education, home ownership education, housing, counseling, workforce development, and credit placemaking, which is the intersection of art and culture for economic development strategy. I request you support House File 875 to stabilize Hamilton neighborhood, Hamilton Midway neighborhood, and African immigrant to build a cultural hub for African immigrant and our region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gigalu, and thank you, Representative Zhang. Next up, we have Chair Lilly, a draft language code at CG 109. Please proceed, Chair Lilly. Thank you, uh, Chair Lee and committee members. And uh, this is for the Walk on TP uh, uh, Center. Um, it's in uh, Representative Jung's uh, neighborhood, right, right near the Capitol. And, uh, and happy to work with uh, Representative Jung and carry this today and you know, uh, move it forward. Uh, it's a great project. If you, if you, just to give you an idea where it is, when you were at that bridge that we uh, uh, have toured and uh, we saw blocks falling, it's right there. It's underneath there in the uh, uh, Vento Nature Center. 
And the walk-on TV is going to be a great uh, facility when we can finish it. And I know Representative Chick Erdahl uh, had it in his bill and um, um, Representative Murphy as well, but they've had to move and um, had some problems. Today I have uh, the director, uh, uh, Ms. Lawrence, and hopefully she can dig it, do a deeper dive here quick for you, Mr. Chair. It's Ms. Lawrence, great. please uh, identify yourself with the record and proceed. Uh, well, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Fu Lee and uh, Vice Chair Murphy uh, for hearing our, our project today and Representative Lilly for championing this uh, project today, as well as all the support, uh, Representative Zhang. And uh, I'm just really excited to be part of a, a powerful cohort of East Side leaders today that are presenting projects that are really gonna shift the, the community here on the East Side of St. Paul. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about our project. Um, uh, my name is Maggie Lorenz and I'm the executive director for Lower Phelan Creek Project and the Wilcon TP Center Development. And I'm really honored to be leading this project which has been called legacy work by elders in our community. The Wilcon TP site itself is an ancient Dakota sacred site on the east side of St. Paul. That includes a cave that is now known as Carver's Cave in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary and the burial mounds at Indian Mounds Regional Park. So Wakan TP Center will be located in the Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary on St. Paul's East Side and, our, and we anticipate that we will break ground this summer and complete construction in the fall of 2022. The project has already uh, gained a $4 million capital investment from the state. So we thank you all for your support in that. And in addition, we've raised uh, $2.5 million in private and federal funding for the project, including a highly competitive challenge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, along with support from the Margaret A. Cargill Fund of Minneapolis Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, McNeely, St. Paul Foundation, Bigelow, Hardenburg, Manitou Fund, and more. Um, this 9,000 square foot cultural and environmental interpretive center will really be a one of its kind, one of its kind uh, indigenous led space, creating a community gathering space, permanent indoor and outdoor and virtual exhibits and teaching gardens uh, will create new living wage jobs in environmental conservation and the cultural arts on the east side of St. Paul. The building will also be a green net zero carbon model for climate resilient construction. So the history and environmental and cultural heritage programming that we offer at the site will impact generations to come. And our conservative estimates that we anticipate serving about 35,000 people annually, including nearly 5,000 St. Paul Public School fifth graders who already visit this site as part of the St. Paul Public Schools implementation of the Bedote curriculum. So this will really be an asset for uh, a lot of folks and uh, people who are doing work already in this area. Um, through our indigenous led, but not indigenous exclusive engagement model, Wakan TP Center will not really be a typical museum or interpretive center, but serve as a transformative healing space that will really shift the urban environment on the east side of St. Paul. And so I'm just really inspired to hear from other folks doing this type of work on the east side. Uh, you know, we, we currently rent space at the Latino Economic Development Center at the East Side Enterprise Center. So there's just some amazing things happening on the east side of St. Paul right now. And I'm really excited to be uh, presenting just uh, on this project as part of this really transfor transformation that's happening on the east side. Um, I just Lawrence, wanna... can I have you wrap up please? Yes. Uh, I just want to quickly touch on the economic impacts of this. We're going to be using a community wealth building model, and we've been working with the Minnesota uh, University of Minnesota Carlson School of Management, who conducted a study for that and forms our work. Uh, it's going to bring a lot of new investment, and we anticipate at least $140,000 annually of indirect investment to the east side of St. Paul uh, economy with this project. So if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them, but that's all I'll say for now. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence, and thank you, Chair Lilly, for bringing this forward. Uh, members, this wrap up the equity-related uh, portion of the agenda. Next up, we have Representative Hewitt, House File 1753. Please proceed, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for giving me the opportunity to present this. This is a very uh, simple, straightforward bill. Many of us have had to uh, have, have had the opportunity to work with the uh, food lines that we've had during the last two years. Um, this, uh, this consortium basically uh, is asking us to 
help them uh, with their infrastructure in the tone of 7.3 million. Um, what they're looking for is to, uh, to continue the service um, that they've already started. Many of these, uh, many parts of this consortium are in our communities already. Um, they are here to testify and I'm gonna turn it over to them right away. I believe uh, it is um, Mary McCowan, uh, president of Keystone Communities. Uh, Ms. McEwen, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning. My name is Mary McEwen. I'm president of Keystone Community Services. And today I'm representing a coalition of food shelf hunger relief organizations that are seeking one-time infrastructure support from the state of Minnesota. I want to thank Representative Hewitt for carrying this bill forward and Chair Lee and the committee for giving me an opportunity to speak today on behalf of our coalition. As you all know, before the pandemic, Minnesotans were visiting food shelves and that number was increasing steadily, uh, which has strained the infrastructure of all of our organizations long before the pandemic. Um, Minnesota food shelf usage in 2020 hit an all time high and the number of seniors visiting food shelves has increased by 30%. Across the state, food shelf organizations modified, changed, shifted, and did everything we could to meet the significant increase in need in food resources. Many of the people who are coming to us have never visited a food shelf before or reached out and asked for help. Uh, at a Keystone sponsored drive through food distribution last month in Roseville, of the 2,800 pe people who receive food at that food distribution, 60% of them have never gotten services from Keystone in the past. Uh, the need for food supports in our community continues to be high and will be for months to come for people like Julia. Julia lives in a suburban community in Ramsey County. Uh, she first came to Keystone in April of 2020 when her job hours were reduced due to the pandemic. Uh, the food and household supplies that she's able to get monthly from Keystone are helping her stabilize her household while she deals with her new financial realities. One of the things she learned when she was at the food shelf was that she was also able to bring um, food back for her elderly neighbors who also need food resources. And so she's doing that every month and she's always looked out for her elderly neighbors and is thrilled that while she's getting help, she's able to help others too. Her hours continue to be reduced and she isn't sure when she's gonna work full time again. There are thousands of families like Julia's across the state of Minnesota who are unsure about their financial future. And our organizations have been there every step of the way, helping over 52,000 Minnesota residents with our organizations alone, um, make sure that they have the food and the resources that they need. Um, hunger relief organizations like ours have been incredibly innovative in responding to the increased need but we simply do not have the adequate building infrastructure to store, sort, and distribute the food that our community needs to keep up with these increased demands. The capital investment projects included in this bill would provide $7 million in state funds for four hunger relief organizations across the state of Minnesota, $3 million to Keystone Community Services, $1.5 million to Southern Anoka Community Assistance, 1.5 million to 360 communities and 1 million to community pathways of Steel County. These funds will be matched and exceeded by funding from our community donations, bringing an additional seven plus million dollars in investments in the communities of the coalition members. Our food shelf programs were at capacity before the pandemic and we anticipate needs will only increase due to the long economic recovery that's ahead for our low income residents in Minnesota. Seniors and families need healthy food resources to help them stay in their homes, pay their bills, and stay focused on work and school. Please support House File 1753 to provide one-time funds to expand the infrastructure of our food shelves so we can provide more food to more people and help our community. Thank you for your time today and for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Ms. McEwen. So uh, I may have spoken, misspoken, uh, the previous bill was House File 1753. Next on the agenda is House File 2464. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, uh, Chair Lee, and thank you members again for listening to uh, uh, my bill here. It's uh, basically, this is the infrastructure, uh, I'm sorry, asset preservation bill for the Minnesota Histori Historical Society. Um, 
we've made a commitment as legislators, the last 5,000 of us have at least to make sure that we preserve these uh, assets of the state from the Split Rock, Split Rock Lighthouse to the Jeffers uh, Petro gifts. Um, it's really important that we are able to uh, have our uh, history there and be able to interpret it. Um, and uh, we need to continue to preserve these assets. Uh, I'm gonna quickly turn it over to the uh, CEO of the Minnesota History Center, uh, Historical Society, uh, Mr. Kent Whiteworth. Uh, Mr. Whitworth, please identify yourself with the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee, members of the committee. My name is Kent Whitworth, and I'm the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. I appreciate the opportunity to take just a few minutes to talk about the asset preservation needs at MNHS. And Representative Hewitt, thank you so much for authoring the bill, and thank you for your passion for history and for bringing it forward to the committee. Um, I'd like to, to just remind everybody that MNHS manages on behalf of the state of Minnesota a historic site network that includes 26 different sites open to the public and more than 150 historic structures on the grounds. We've had the privilege to visit with, with many of you uh, in the last couple of uh, weeks or months, and we're grateful for that. Um, but uh, as the representative said, uh, these the network uh, really kind of spans from Split Rock uh, Lighthouse up in the northeast portion of the state uh, down to the southwest to Jeffers Petroglyphs and literally everything in between. You see the bullets there. Um, one of the things that I'd like to, to, to reinforce though is these historic structures are significant. They're important buildings in their own right, uh, but they also are valuable because they are the place where we present interpretive programs. Um, these programs are designed uh, based, by, uh, based on the priorities of our strategic plan. You see those priorities before you, but I would just point out uh, the inclusion and diversity uh, strategic priority at MNHS. We welcome and serve all Minnesotans, and that means collecting and sharing the stories of all Minnesotans. And frankly, I was inspired uh, by the previous test, uh, testifiers and the emphasis on, um, on equity. And so MNHS is committed to um, uh, inclusion, equity, and diversity. And I think you will find that in our interpretive programs at all the historic sites. Um, the next image talks a little bit about, or just presents a, the laundry list, if you will, that totals more than $10 million. This is the prioritized list of projects uh, within our, our network. And I will at this point mention that, that we are falling behind. Um, our requests have, um, have been much higher than the appropriations. And uh, as any of you, as you take care of your own properties, your own homes, uh, once you start to get behind, um, uh, that's not a great place to find yourself in. So, so these are prioritized projects that we'd really like to move forward on as soon as possible. I'll just give you a couple of quick highlights of, of the network. We start with Split Rock. You see this gorgeous, a view that so many of us have enjoyed along the North Shore. But let me remind you that one of the projects recently completed is a new HVAC system for the visitor center. So some of these projects aren't always the most um, um, publicly appealing, but they are absolutely critical to the safety and the quality of experience. Perfect example at Split Rock is this accessibility uh, project. And you see the paths that we are trying to add to that historic site so that everyone will have uh, greater access to that spectacular uh, view there at the lighthouse. Um, uh, historic Forestville is another example. Uh, I think of the Meehan family that came to, to uh, Southeast Minnesota in the mid 19th century. And today we talk about what is it that makes a place a home and what is it that makes a family leave their home and, and start anew. That's the story of Forestville. You see the asset preservation needs, you see some before and after scenes of, of what these funds has, have been able to do. Um, but those are the kinds of stories that we think all Minnesotans can relate to. And Forestville is a great example of that. Uh, moving on uh, from Forestville, uh, you're all familiar with historic Fort Snelling. One of the projects that's on that list is work to the round tower. But this is certainly a military story at Fort Snelling, but it's much more than that. 
there's a 10,000 year history at the confluence of the two rivers at Pedote, and we are um, focusing on that broader narrative. Mill City Museum, you get a sense of the scale of this property. Um, one thing I'll say about Mill City very quickly is we are one of the few places in America <laughs> that are managing ruins. And you know the fire from the early 1990s. And many of these materials that we try to preserve are, are, were never meant to be in the elements. So there are particular preservation challenges at Mill City. And I'll wrap up quickly with, with the Hill House, which is just right down the street from uh, the Capitol. And you see that there's intrusion of water that's created challenges at Mill City. So that gives you a, a very quick tour across our network. We thank you so much for your consideration of our request and are happy to follow up after the hearing with additional information. Representative Rasmus, a quick question or comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to thank Representative Hewitt for bringing this bill forward and just thank the Minnesota Historical Society. I know it's been a challenging year for them to do history and to allow Minnesotans to access history of this last year, but uh, I'm just very supportive of their work and uh, just truly believe that the different sites and assets that they have are truly uh, statewide assets that every Minnesotan gets to benefit from. Uh, in the district that I represent, you know, the Historical Society was involved with helping uh, uh, publish a, a history on uh, the city of Fergus Falls after their uh, 150th anniversary. Uh, history Day students getting to go to these facilities, field trips, tourism dollars, and so just really appreciate the uh, thoughtful proposal before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the comments, Representative Rasmussen. Next up is Representative Olson, House uh, Language Code of CG 111-1. Uh, Please proceed, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So the Lake Superior Zoo was originally founded in 1923 and is now home to more than 350 animals. They provide a variety of educational opportunities and participate in conservation initiatives. This bill provides 1.1 million, 1 .1 million to, this, to deed Geo bonds via deed to the city of Duluth for asset preservation to the Lake Superior Zoo. These funds would help make necessary improvements to the facility, including accessibility and walking sur surface improvements, light lighting upgrades and additional deferred maintenance, as well as drainage improvements on the Black Bear exhibit pool. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifier, Ms. Cope, the Chief Executive Officer at the Lake Superior Zoo. Ms. Cope, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Lee, Representative Olson, and committee members. My name is Haley Cope, and I am the CEO at the Lake Superior Zoo. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can quickly go through um, just the request that we have on the table today. So our mission at the Lake Superior Zoo is to provide close-up animal experiences that inspire connections to wildlife and action toward conservation in our region here in Minnesota and around the world. And some of those photos you'll see there is kind of our mission in action and funding from capital investment from the state allows us to continue to provide these close up experiences and serve our community. So just a quick 101 history and what's going on today at the zoo, uh, like Representative Olson said, we were founded in 1923. We are the 19th oldest zoo in the United States. So as you can assume, along with that comes with some old infrastructure, our main building and our pathways are many decades old. Adapting to the pandemic this past year has been difficult for nonprofit organizations and we were definitely not immune to that. We faced two closures to help stop and slow the spread of COVID-19. We pivoted to a reopening strategy that has been very successful and are, we're so thankful to our community members for supporting us. We also introduced free learning, virtual uh, learning opportunities like our virtual Zoomobiles to schools in the region and around the state. Our AZA accreditation is upcoming in 2022, and that's why this project is so important to us today. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums is the kind of general organization that oversees only 10% of zoos and aquarium facilities in the United States that receive that accreditation, and we're one of three in the state. Being accredited by the AZA is critical to our operations as we work to accomplish our mission. This accreditation means we uphold the highest standards across multiple facets of operations, including animal care and welfare, safety, and more. So again, our asset preservation request today is $1.1 million. And that will give us um, the necessary upgrades to continue to obtain that accreditation and prepare for that, such as the walking surfaces and accessibility at the front entrance and circulation throughout zoo grounds, upgrade lighting throughout facilities, looking at some LED and energy cost savings, 
addressing our front, front entrance canopy paint issues and additional deferred maintenance. Additionally, connective drainage work and improvements on existing black bear, black bear exhibit pool. So here's a couple of photos that are just some examples of areas at the zoo that are in much need of preservation for us to be able to continue our mission and be able to provide an educational, fun, and of course, safe experience for guests from Duluth, the state of Minnesota, and beyond. Our vision, if awarded these funds, is to preserve the historic Lake Superior Zoo so that it can be enjoyed by all people for generations to come. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide this information on our important request today, and I would welcome any questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Cope, and thank you, Representative Olson. Next up on the agenda is Representative Ryan House File 2081. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. I'm pleased to introduce House File 2181, which requires energy guidelines for state buildings to incorporate provisions that address resiliency with respect to climate change. There is no cost associated with this bill. At our joint session with the Climate and Energy Committee, we had the opportunity to hear about this from Richard Graves, Director of the Center for Sustainable Building Research at the University of Minnesota. I'd like to now turn this pre uh, presentation over to Professor Graves to tell us more about this bill. Professor Graves, please proceed. Thank you, Representative Ryer, uh, Chair Lee, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, in in uh, 2018, the Center for Sustainable Building Research completed a study funded by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency titled Resilient Adaptation of Sustainable Buildings. The study looked at the potential integration of resilient design into the Minnesota Sustainable Building Guidelines, known as B3. As you know, B3 is a set of tools and programs designed to make, make buildings more energy efficient and sustainable, and has been working with state-funded projects for almost 20 years now. The B3 programs have been developed for and are required for all state funded projects in Minnesota. The study found that some of the existing guidelines have aspects that do enhance sustainability and resilience, such as uh, enhanced site design for stormwater management uh, to deal with um, localized flooding and other uh, climate change effects. Uh, the SB 2030 energy and carbon standard required for B3 um, enhances buildings to be more energy efficient and reduce loads uh, so that they integrate more effectively with on-site renewable energy and the potential for ba uh, battery storage to achieve net zero energy and carbon. While the B3 guidelines provide a good base for a resilient building, there's an opportunity to expand the guidelines to create more robust buildings that are better able to handle disasters and disturbances and respond to climate change effects. Some measures should be modified and some new measures um, could be incorporated. Potential measures include use of on-site renewables to generate energy to meet critical loads, including battery storage and renewable energy systems capable of storing critical uh, energy uh, demands during, um, during disturbances, enabling microgrid strategies to share reserve power uh, or generation capa capacity on campuses and, and in uh, community scenarios, elevating uh, mechanical and electrical equipment to avoid localized flooding events, considering designs for dual mode operation, day-to-day -day, and also emergency low power modes, enhancing structures and facade elements and site landscape to withstand extreme weather events, and then educating building owners, operators, users, and stakeholders on resilient features, operations, and planning. Inclusions of these measures will lead to buildings and the people in those buildings to be able to be better able to deal with disaster events, emergencies, and respond to the effects of climate change. New guidelines will continue to be reviewed to be cost effective both in initial capital costs and also in long term operational costs. Thank you for your time. Uh, Professor Graves, can you identify yourself with the record, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Building Research at the University of Minnesota, and we uh, manage the B3 guidelines for the state of Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Professor Graves, and thank you, Representative Ryer. Next up on the agenda is my bill, House File 2320. I will continue to preside as chair and members. Uh, as we have seen with uh, some of the requests around a regional public safety center uh, over the last few years, we have seen some requests for uh, regional and co uh, county jails. And so I wanted to see if we could uh, have the Department of Corrections do a report to study the need of a regional and county jails to so take a look at uh, consolidation or mergers of county jails and alternatives to incarcerations for people 
uh, experiencing mental health disorders. And uh, we're uh, requesting uh, the DLC to uh, consult with county sheriffs, county and city attorneys, and uh, pu uh, public defenders, uh, chief law enforcement officers, administrators of uh, county jails and facilities, and district court administrators to really uh, assess the need that we have. And uh, with us today, um, I did not work uh, with uh, the commissioner, but uh, the commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner Snell, is uh, willing to come by and testify on this bill today. And so, I'll proceed with uh, Commissioner Snell. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to come in. I want to thank you for bringing this measure forward. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I think I've learned uh, from having conversations with you and uh, Chair Murphy, when she formally led, the, led this committee, is that, that really these are big policy decisions. Uh, and, the, and bonding uh, and, and these capital investments are really a focus on um, the state policy and we know that jails and, and these uh, sorts of facilities have major costs to community, communities. And uh, we think it's really wise that there is bringing together uh, of a variety of stakeholders to look at these issues and to study them uh, and ultimately to, uh, to develop a more comprehensive policy um, that might help um, counties uh, save money, um, be more efficient, uh, and meet the, the ever-changing demands of people who enter uh, the criminal justice system. And I think at the end of the day, uh, ultimately, it's to help people be successful uh, outside the criminal justice system. And that's why we should exist. So I, we, I just wanted to come in and give voice to the fact that we stand uh, fully supportive of this measure and uh, look forward to the opportunity to, uh, to work together to uh, develop good policies around this. Our commissioners. Uh, so now, since we have you in front of us, I, I do have uh, two questions for you. Uh, currently, and as recently as yes, this past week, I understand that DLC has been making recommendations to county boards and uh, around the feasibility of regional or joint jails between two or more counties. Are you looking at factors such as how COVID has impacted jail populations with or without impact to uh, public safety? And are you making any recommendations accordingly? Yes, I think, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. We, we know that uh, even the Association of Minnesota Counties is looking at the fact that, you know, there was a significant reduction in population, both in state correctional facilities as well as uh, uh, county facilities, and there was not a, a, a representative up uptick in crime as you look, at the, uh, look across the board. And so the reality is that, that there is ways for us to be able to manage this. You know, we do think that uh, it is important that we take uh, this comprehensive uh, view. Uh, that has not always been part of our history uh, in terms of the role we play. There are a number of jails uh, that are um, facing sunsets. Uh, we are, uh, you, you know, this committee has invested in the last October's bonding bill, you know, $45 million was invested in local facilities. So we do think that, that looking at what we can learn from COVID is really important from a public policy standpoint, both for the state as well as local communities who, who grapple with how do we keep up with the, uh, the, the burdens of um, the demands of maintaining these facilities and the needs of people who are in them. And so the opportunity to, for, uh, for the systems to come together and really explore what that could look like and the challenges uh, and solutions to those challenges is something that we think is critical. And so we are definitely are, are moving more in the direction of taking, um, of working with the counties to really explore all options, not just to build a, a jail that meets their needs today. Uh, and we know that oftentimes people say, well, we're gonna build a jail that meets the future needs. And that simply means that we can put more people in jail. And we have to remember that at the end of the day, it has to be about public safety and it has to be about representing the fact that you know, these are uh, criminal justice issues, these are economic issues and, uh, and human rights issues, given the fact that many people can't, uh, that are sitting in jails can't afford to pay the bail, whereas others can. So I think uh, we do think that this is a, a, an opportune time um, for us as a state to take a look at this and, uh, and, and as the DOC, as the regulatory body, who oversees many of these and approves many of these construction projects, that we will be taking a very different approach to working with the counties and really looking at uh, have you assess the fullest range of possibilities um, for the good of your uh, county and, and even uh, the region. Um, we know that many of these counties simply 
uh, are, are facing really difficult challenges in making investments that are often 30 to $50 million. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Snell. And uh, one last question uh, for you as we uh, make considerations around some of these local requests. I understand that the uh, Department of Correction is currently required by statute to give advice to county boards if they ought to build a new jail or to expand. Uh, within your current authority, Commissioner, are you able to uh, do a deeper dive into the local policies around arrests, uh, pre-trial detention, bill issues, et cetera, as I have laid out in my bill? And uh, do you make uh, recommendations broader than just those related to the physical infrastructure? And, and I, I, Mr. Chair, I think one of the, one of the reasons I really uh, think your bill, bill is important is that you set a framework uh, for requiring us as the regulatory authority, uh, body uh, to be asking different kinds of questions. In the past, it was often, you know, does the facility meet the standards, uh, the national and state standards around jail construction, space for programming and so forth, all important issues. But you, this bill, I think, um, prompts us to ask broader and bigger questions that should be asked as we consider uh, these types of investments and what re rep represents good public policy. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Snell, for coming by to uh, provide some public testimony today. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Chair Murphy, uh, Language Code of CG 108. Chair Murphy. Uh, Chair Murphy, you are on mute right now. Yes, I'm excited. Commissioner Snell, you've risen to the occasion once again that we've asked for you, and uh, we look forward to working with you on your continued uh, analysis that you're going to present back to us. Um, Mr. Chair, the uh, asset preservation part of uh, state, public, uh, county, and public and city libraries um, has been stagnant for a long, long time. And this is a year for asset preservation reports. And I, Liz Lynch, the executive director of Lake Agassiz Regional Library System is on, uh, ready to tell you the importance of the small library uh, grant program that has been in existence for a long time. but at a stagnant amount of money. And uh, in the past uh, bonding bill, uh, we raised the amount that could be put into a small grant. And so I would like to listen to Ms. Lynch tell of the importance of the library grants. Ms. Lynch, uh, if you could re uh, keep your remarks within two minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Please identify yourself and proceed. Sounds good. Good morning, everyone, Chair Lee and members of the committee. My name is Liz Lynch, and I'm the Executive Director of the Lake Agassiz Regional Library System, which is headquartered in Moorhead, Minnesota. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the 12 regional public library systems, which provide public library service in over 365 communities across the state. And of course, thank you, Representative Murphy, for your support of a $3 million library bonding bill for construction and renovation grants for public libraries. This past year was a true test for public libraries, but we rose to the occasion and went above and beyond to meet the needs of our community members. We were pivoting left and right to offer library services as safely, efficiently, and effectively as we could. And if we've learned anything from this pandemic, we've learned that libraries play a vital role in Minnesota's educational and social infrastructure. As public library services continue to be in high demand around the state and throughout the nation, we need to make sure that our library facilities are functional, accessible, and are able to provide the proper space and functionality to help people succeed. Since 1995, over 150 communities have benefited from the library projects funded by the Library Construction Grant Program. Grants ranging from $3,000 to $1 million have assisted in renovation projects that have improved ADA accessibility and have provided funding for new construction. 
Currently, approximately 30 public libraries across the state are in need of construction projects. While the total price tag of these projects is upwards of 50 million, the matching portion from this construction grant program is currently around 11 million. So while we need 11 million, 3 million is a great start at chipping away at these projects. With $3 million, we can leverage local funds to make progress for our community members. Please support our $3 million request to ensure that public libraries can continue to provide accessible and equitable services to our community members. Through this dollar for dollar matching construction program, we can ensure that we're operating efficient and effective facilities that provide the necessary services and space to help people succeed. Thank you for your consideration this morning. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lynch, and thank you, Chair Murphy, for bringing this bill uh, forward. A uh, member, that concludes our uh, agenda for today. I just want to give you a roadmap for the week ahead and uh, for members of the public. So uh, on Sunday, uh, April 11th, we will be posting the DE amendment and the spreadsheet for uh, this committee. It will be House File 337, the Onibus 2021 bonding bill. Uh, the committee will meet three times next week on Monday, uh, April 12th at one o'clock for the rollout and walkthrough of the DE amendment. On Wednesday, April 14th at 1 p.m., uh, we'll take public testimony. And on Friday, uh, April 16th at 8.30, we'll uh, take amendments and markup. There will be a 24-hour rule in place for amendments. Uh, detailed notification will be uh, coming out today to outline the schedule for all of you. And uh, thank you, members, for all the work that you have done uh, so far at this uh, session. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair.